all for your patience um, and welcome to the first 3IE uh, members uh, webinar series. Um, and this will be on the story of Worm Wars, what policymakers should know about the hottest development debate of 2015. Um, so my name's Jen Ludwig. I'm the um, senior program manager at 3IE and I'm uh, the lead on our member engagement activities. And I just wanted to say a couple of words about the webinar series before handing it over to our speakers. My audio has been lost. Okay, so the, um, the member webinar series is a quarterly uh, webinar for members only. Um, it'll be posted and uh, on our website at, at some point later on, but um, for the actual webinars, it, it's meant for, um, for members, um, staff of our member agencies, with the purpose of exploring issues and innovations related to rigorous evidence for development decision-making. Um, we'll be having presentations um, from member representatives, from um, 3IE staff, from external experts like we have today. Um, and actually the, um, the member webinar series, the, the concept for it actually came out of um, a comment that one of the member representatives made at our annual uh, members conference last April, where she said, you know, um, you often, you meaning 3IE, often interact with um, member representatives or staff of member agencies that you are directly involved in projects together, but actually your members are, are large agencies with a lot of staff. So this is a way that we're hoping to connect with people that we don't necessarily get to meet um, in person. Um, and then it just also falls into sort of the, the general demand that we're receiving from members for more peer learning opportunities, um, member interest in strengthening the community of practice um, that we've been building. And um, so we're really happy to have you here. So our speakers today, um, we have David Evans, he's the senior economist for the Chief Economist's Office for the Africa Region of the World Bank. Um, David coordinates impact evaluation work across sectors for the Africa Region. In the past, he worked as Senior Economist in the Human Development Department in the Latin America and Caribbean Region of the World Bank, and as an economist designing and implementing impact evaluations in Africa. He's designed and implemented impact evaluations in agriculture, early childhood development, education, governance, health, and social protection in Brazil, the Gambia, Kenya, Mexico, Sierra Leone, and Tanzania. He coordinated the World Bank's efforts to estimate the economic impact of the West African Ebola epidemic of 2014-2015. He's published in Demography, Economic Development and Cultural Change, The Lancet, The Lancet Global Health, and World Development. He teaches economic development at the Party Rand Graduate School of Public Policy, and he holds a PhD in economics from Harvard University. So uh, Dave will be um, making the main presentation, um, and Ben uh, Wood, who is our um, 3IE evaluation specialist for replication, will be mainly uh, joining for the Q&A. Um, ben uh, co-manages the replication program from our DC office. He provides um, oversight of the contracted replications of impact evaluations and conducts uh, replications for 3IE. He previously held short-term consultancies with the World Bank and the International Food Policy Research Institute in Malawi in conjunction with his dissertation research. Ben holds a PhD in agricultural and applied economics 
from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. His dissertation examines the effects of food price increases on health in Malawi and on poverty in Mexico. His research interests include food insecurity and health. So I'm just gonna um, turn it over to Ben for a quick minute to just say a few words and then we'll um, move on to Dave. We are to have Dave Evans here and to, to talk a little bit about this one more story that happened and I know there was a lot of ink spilled from the original papers to the systematic reviews to studies to the responses to the blogs to the independent reevaluation of the original paper and the replication studies uh, and Dave Evans has anthologized everything which we'll send you some links to at the end but we, uh, we're really excited to have him here to, to talk a little bit about the story and his main takeaways from this whole big thing. So without further ado, thanks, Dave. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Ben I, and uh, Jennifer. I'm really looking forward to this. So today uh, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the worm wars and what they are and what they teach us. Uh, like Ben said, a lot happened. There was a lot of uh, ink spilled, as he said, but I actually think that we learned quite a bit um, about uh, both public health and research and what works in international development as a result of this. So first, let me highlight the problem. Intestinal helminths infect more than one quarter of the world's population. So this includes hookworm, ringworm, schistosomiasis, and others. These are really nasty. They have a wide range of health effects, anemia, malnutrition, pain, uh, listlessness, which can affect how well children do in school and adults do in work. This is a major global problem. Now, one proposed solution for this problem is school-based mass treatment. Low-cost single-dose therapies can kill the worms by 99% without uh, significant side effects if people who don't actually have the worms are treated. Reinfection is rapid, requiring retreatment, so kids would have to be retreated depending on the, on the particular intestinal helminth, either once a year or twice a year. Now, everyone agrees that children who have worms should be treated for worms. The trick is that in many low-income environments, the cost of going in and testing each child for worms every six months or every year and then treating those individual ch children is frankly prohibitive, especially in rural areas. So that's why there's this one proposed solution, which is school-based mass treatment. So a number of people have proposed, well, why not simply treat all the children in the school since we don't have significant side effects on children who don't have the worms and will gain the benefits at relatively low cost. So how do these, quote, worm wars come about? So in 2004, the results of an impact evaluation by Edward Miguel and Michael Kramer demonstrated that mass school deworming in Kenya improved health and school participation. It also had big spillovers to untreated children in the school. So for example, when they did this treatment in the schools, some of the kids weren't at the school at the time, they were absent or maybe they were homesick, and even those kids had significant benefits, these spillovers, because they weren't getting worms from the other kids who had been treated. Miguel and Kramer also find, found significant impacts on children in neighboring schools. So even if you weren't in the same school, if you were in a, a school in a, you know, relatively close by, you had less exposure to worms. So this is not the only study that demonstrates the positive impact of mass deworming, but it was a highly influential study. This study led in part to uh, a, a major scale up in, the, in, in Kenya of uh, school-based deworming and a number of other global initiatives. Now fast forward about a decade. Last summer, in July of 2015, a replication of that same evaluation was published, suggesting that many of the results do uh, hold consistent, uh, for example, showing that uh, the deworming still did improve outcomes for health uh, for children in uh, schools and those spillovers within the schools 
But at the same time, it showed that some of those spillovers to neighboring schools didn't seem to hold up to further scrutiny. At this, about the same time, a new systematic review attempting to bring together not just this study, but all of the studies that look at uh, mass school-based deworming was published, and it suggested that the deworming benefits are really limited to weight gain, that we don't really have any evidence that there are significant improvements in schooling outcomes, labor market outcomes, cognitive outcomes, or any of the other, these other things we care about. And so we have this highly influential study and then we have a replication of that study, which confirms most of the findings, but calls some of the most important findings about these spillovers into question, and a new systematic review that suggests maybe these findings aren't consistent with a broader literature. Now, there was a, a significant amount of media coverage uh, coming out of this and a subsequent discussion. On basically the day that these two studies came out, we had two major pieces. One was by Ben Goldacre, publishing at uh, BuzzFeed, who writes that scientists are hoarding data and it's ruining medical research. The second, by Sarah Bosley at The Guardian, that new research debunks the merits of global deworming programs. Now, these articles were just the beginning. As you can see here, over the ensuing days and weeks, literally dozens of pieces were written by academics, journalists, policymakers, and others in the United States, in the UK, in Kenya, and elsewhere. Really, the amount of uh, the amount that was written and analyzed related to this is truly striking. So, how do we make sense of all this coverage? So, let's take to start this first piece, uh, or the second piece on this sheet by Sarah Bosley. New research debunks the merits of global deworming programs. So if you look at this piece, just a couple of key quotes. Deworming children offers very little benefit despite millions of dollars spent on it according to a reanalysis of the evidence. The view of those who promote deworming is that it is a single solution to multiple problems in low and middle income countries. In other words, the people promoting deworming are promoting a panacea, something that will solve all of the problems. Now, if you're a policymaker, and even many who aren't policymakers, you might be like the gentleman at the bottom of this slide who really doesn't know what to make of this. I mean, this seems to make a compelling case that this deworming doesn't really make sense. Now, that said, there are a couple of red flags that come up in the course of this reporting. They wouldn't necessarily jump out to the casual reader, but when you look at it closely, you see a couple of things. For example, in that same journal where that replication study was published, there was an author response, and we'll come back to that later, but it brought up a lot of questions about whether, in fact, those results were debunked. That response was published in the same journal on the same day. It was available, no mention of it in this media piece. Second, rather than quoting a supporter of deworming, what the article did was they quoted a critic of deworming, characterizing the views of the proponents. Now, I have a lot of strong views about a lot of topics, but if an article is going to cite my views, I'd much rather they speak to me and let me put my views on the record, rather than quoting someone who disagrees with me strongly and puts those views forward as mine. So these were a couple red flags. We'll come back later to how to pick out more of these red flags in the future. So example two, Ben Goldacre wrote an article that basically focused rather than on whether the results of this particular deworming study were correct or not correct, rather what he focused on was the importance of replication and deworm and, and, and transparency in social science. For example, he says that the deworming study was an excellent piece of research. He points out that Miguel and Kramer had the decency, generosity, strength of character, and intellectual confidence to let someone, someone else uh, put their head under the bonnet of the car and check out this evidence. And he says, we need to be doing this much more. Now, at the same time, the header of this article was an image of a child apparently undergoing extreme trauma while receiving a deworming tablet in Latin America. And so even though Goldacre's coverage may have been relatively balanced, it's difficult for a reader to go into it uh, without uh, drawing a certain uh, preconceived notion from the cover image. So there were a flood of responses to both the original article, the replications, and then a range of other issues. For example, uh, Alex Berger at GiveWell, which is one of the main organizations that looks at um, the uh, that looks at 
effective altruism, where are the best ways to give your charity dollars. His takeaway is that, well, regardless of whether the results hold up, what if we look at the labor outcomes 10 years later? And he quotes, this is a quote from, the, uh, from a paper written by Miguel Kramer and others looking at results later, and they find that you know, men were enrolled for more years of primary school, they worked more hours, they spent more time in self-employment, women were more likely to have att attended secondary school, it halved the gender gap, huge positive impacts on the labor market. So that's one response was to say, well, independent of the results of this replication, there are other findings that make this seem worthwhile. On the right, on the other hand, you'll see Charles Mondoiro, who's a Kenyan researcher from the Kenyan Medical Research Institute. He writes that as a scientist and a Kenyan, I have reviewed the evidence and authored numerous studies quantifying the massive problems and that show how mass deworming lowers the prevalence of these helmets. And if you jump down to the bottom, let me say unequivocally, mass school-based deworming works. So we have journalists on the one hand claiming that these findings have been debunked. We have uh, a blog response saying, well, it doesn't really matter if they've been debunked or not because there are other findings that say the same thing. We have experts from the country where the study has been done saying, well, it in fact absolutely works independent of what this replication says. And there are a number of other takeaways. Tim Harford, a journalist and economist who, from Oxford University says, well, why do we have such a big policy push based on relatively few clinical trials? So his takeaway in the end is that the de original deworming study probably holds up. But that said, it would be much better to produce more information, running more trials to see where, why, and how deworming treatments work or do not work, rather than simply focusing over and over on the same study. Ben Wood, who you just heard from a few minutes ago here at 3IE, highlighted this point, the replication studies have sparked a larger conversation around the existing deworming evidence. These conversations are public, which allows for scrutiny of the findings and a general discussion of the research. And these dozens and dozens of news and blog articles, as well as research pieces, are clear evidence that Ben's exactly right, that these have sparked a truly broad conversation. The trick is that when the journalism is weak, or when some of the writing is uninformed, it can muddy the evidence so that in fact people walk away more confused than they were to start with, especially people who aren't technical experts. There were also a series of defenses. So Paul Gertler, a professor at UC Berkeley, says, sadly last week we saw a major step backward in global health with the launch of a media frenzy around children's deworming. The replication shows that you can eliminate the impact of deworming on school attendance if you torture the data. So he, he clearly looks at this with a, a strong defensive perspective towards the original research. And open later, a letter that was signed by several organizations that are invested in deworming, right? It's that the systematic review by the Cochrane Collaboration, this new systematic review, doesn't take into consideration a number of recent studies that demonstrate the health, educational, and economic benefits of dewarming. So really, there's evidence that there are people voicing opinions on all sides of this. So I know that I'm not talking to an audience of academics, and so the goal here isn't to focus on the exact estimates or the standard errors. But that said, while we're here, I think it's worthwhile to take a few minutes to talk about the actual studies, both the original study and the replications, and a couple of the technical responses that came out of this public conversation. So the original paper identifying impacts on education and health in the presence of treatment externalities. It was a randomized group. The first group received mass deworming treatment in 1998. In the middle of 1999, that treatment also rolled out to the second group of 25 schools. And then the third group of schools didn't receive this mass treatment until 2001. So for the course of most of this study, they served as a comparison group so we could see, well, what's happening in uh, the absence of mass deworming. So within this population, 92% of children had at least one helminth infection. So if deworming makes sense anywhere, it would be here. What they found was a major reduction in moderate and heavy infections, 25 percentage points, a large increase in school participation, and 
admittedly no impact on test scores. In some sense, like I highlighted at the beginning, the most exciting results were the externalities, that even children who didn't get treated largely had significant benefits. So children in the same school had a similar reduction in infection rate to the children who received the treatment. Also, children who didn't receive any medication had for children in other schools further away from uh, these schools that received the mass treatment. Aiken et al. and Davy et al. published two studies that, that re-examine and, uh, and try some different estimation strategies for this research. So in the first study, on the left, they reanalyzed Miguel and Kramer's data. So they confirm most of the findings of that original study. Similar reductions in worm infections, similar reductions in intervention schools, both treatment and externalities. That said, they find little evidence of an indirect effect in these other schools. And they also find no evidence of a total effect on school attendance. So it's key to remember that there are many things that were consistent across the two studies. And of course, in the journalism, a lot of that got lost. The focus was really on what, might have, what was different when the main findings were really consistent. Now, then Davy et al. did another study where they said, well, what if we try a couple of different estimation strategies, some different statistical techniques to examine this? And what they argue is that there's some evidence with a high risk of bias that a school-based drug treatment and health education intervention improved school attendance uh, with no evidence of an effect on examination performance. Okay, so Hicks, Kramer, and Miguel, in the same art, in the same issue of the same journal, published a, a response where they say, "Well, in fact, we do see an overall effect." So what this chart on the left uh, of the screen shows you is, in the black circles, the original effect that Miguel and Kramer estimate, and then in the hollow circles, the white circles, what this updated effect is. So what you can see is that the effect on worm inf infections on the far left is almost exactly the same, or if in fact the effect might be even more powerful in the replication. Likewise, the within school externality, right, the improvements for untreated kids in the schools also gets better. The externalities to other schools up to three kilometers away from the treated schools, that also remains consistent. Now, where things disappear is that in Kramer and Miguel, they find externalities for schools that are much further away, three to six kilometers, whereas uh, the updated replication research found that those results disappeared. On the other hand, uh, Hicks, Kramer, and Miguel argue that this sensitivity that uh, Davy et al. Uh, report really relies on some analytical errors. And so what they then do is they try a bunch of different ways of estimating these results. Do they, they do their own tests. And you can see the black lines in this graph on the right-hand side are their original estimates. And then the gray lines show, well, if we try adjusting a bunch of different statistical uh, decisions, what happens? And they argue that their results are, in fact, quite consistent across a wide range of different areas if you step uh, of different decisions if you step away from analytical errors. So at the same time, this new Cochrane review said that there is quite substantial evidence that deworming programs don't show benefit in terms of average nutritional status, hemoglobin, cognition, school performance, or death. Kramer and Miguel argue, well, there are a bunch of other studies that are relatively recent that actually do show these. Studies that show that seven, eight, ten years later, there are cognitive, test score, labor market impacts. So a lot of these studies are discounted from the Cochrane Review, either because they're new or because in the long run, a lot of these studies eventually rolled out treatment to control children. Now, uh, the Center for Global Development has experts, Michael Clemens and Justin Sandifer, who highlight that if you roll out the, if you rule out including any study that has eventually some sort of treatment of control, you'll never measure the long-term impacts of these programs. One of the things that really came out of this firestorm is that a few different researchers actually went back to the data beyond what Miguel and Kramer had originally done and what Davy et al. and Aiken et al. had done. They went back and reanalyzed it themselves. So Burke Hosler of the World Bank went back and he made one suggestion that, well, why don't we just drop one of the groups that seems controversial? What he found ultimately is overall the results still stand. 
Clemens and Sandifer at the Center for Global Development said, well, there are still externalities, just like Aiden et al. and Davey et al. showed, that those externalities hold up for zero to three kilometers, and they find that the externalities hold up even up to four kilometers away from the treatment schools, but then they tend to disappear. So, you don't need to remember each of these technical details. The key here is that what came out of this conversation was a host of analysis on this one key study. And there are more. I'm not, I'm, I will spare you the rest of them today, but uh, McCartan Humphreys at Columbia University, University also reanalyzed the data. Okay, so what do we take away from all this? So first key is research transparency. So posting data and code is becoming increasingly common. Indeed, Miguel and Kramer, they posted their data and their code some eight years ago. And it's excellent that 3IE is making funding available for researchers to replicate these kinds of findings. This is becoming more and more common, and much of the media coverage uh, that wasn't highlighted so much, but in fact lauded Kramer and Miguel for sharing their data and cooperating with the replicators throughout the process. Now, this shouldn't be unusual, but it still is relatively unusual. And so this is one of the areas where we want to see social science move in the future. And there have been a number of initiatives on this front. Second, synthesizing studies and deworming. So there's a clear need for flexibility beyond what's included in this systematic review. If I'm a policymaker and I'm making a decision about a mass deworming program, I don't in fact want to only know what a randomized control trial tells. I want to know what the best evidence tells me. So I've done some research on systematic reviews in the past, and the best reviews are carried out by well-trained people who can bring all the where you statistically combine the studies when appropriate, but also a discussion of heterogeneity, where some results hold up and some don't and isn't obsessed purely with looking at randomized controlled trials, most of which are high quality, but some of which might not be, and also not ruling out all other studies. Many quasi-experimental studies can also be of extremely high quality. My takeaway on this deworming debate is that there is some debate still over the exact size of the impact and the strength of the distance spillover effects in this one study. But the long-term labor effects are extremely compelling as well as the effects from studies in Uganda, in India, and for younger siblings in Kenya. So another thing to keep in mind that we take away from this is replication versus robustness. And so we should remember that replication really means, and Michael Clemens has done some writing on this, really means just trying to verify and reproduce the exact results that the previous authors did. Whereas robustness is where we reanalyze and explore these and maybe where we try things out in a different context. But beware of perverse incentives. So one of the tricks is that academics, researchers, when they reanalyze someone else's data, it's most exciting if they in fact find something that's different. And so results that are different are more likely to be highlighted than the results that are the same. That's exactly what came out in the media coverage of the worm wars. Many of the results were completely consistent across the two studies. However, the results that were highlighted in the media really were those that differed. Another argument is that just like Tim Harford of Oxford University highlighted, Chris Blattman has highlighted, that we still don't have large-scale, randomized, multi-country long-term evidence on the health, education, and labor market impacts of deworming medicine. We have a number of studies from a few different countries. However, in recent years, there have been some great multi-country studies with a coordinated effort to run more or less the same intervention in multiple countries. This has been done around microcredit, around programs to help the ultra-poor, and what these programs do is they give us a much better sense across countries whether a given program is truly effective. So we're not relying on just one, two, or three studies. The last thing, and I would argue is the most important for you walking away as policymakers who are consuming this research and consuming the media or writing about this, is uh, how do we read social science reporting intelligently? and reporting about development interventions. And I, I owe, uh, this is adapted from some great work by Joe, Jeff Mosenkis at Innovations for Poverty Action. So first, when you read an article, how close does it sound to a press release? So that Guardian article that we talked about that 
claims that the deworming evidence has been debunked. In fact, if you compare that to a press release that was put out by the Cochrane collaboration, they look extremely similar. And so it suggests that conceivably there wasn't a whole lot of additional work done to get the other side of the story. Second, does the story claim to debunk or dramatically overturn established wisdom? So we may not all be scientists, but we all know that that's not really how science works. Science works with one experiment following another experiment, adding a little bit and helping us, giving us more confidence in some cases and less confidence in others. So any story that claims to debunk a major finding should be looked at with real caution and taken with several grains of salt. Were both sides heard from? Another thing that we talked about with that from that Guardian piece was how the proponents of uh, deworming weren't actually heard from. In fact, their views were only characterized by critics of deworming. So a good journalistic piece that looks at something that overturns a previous effect should really be quoting from both sides of the study. Fourth, were independent researchers consulted? Obviously, the people who ran the replication have a vested interest in their results. And frankly, so do the original authors. But there are other experts, other people who aren't directly involved in this research who can speak to this. One of the exciting pieces coming out of the worm wars is that a number of disinterested researchers came back and reanalyzed the data to get to the bottom of the issue. Five, is the debunking finding brand new? So as policymakers, it doesn't make sense to update what we think about an intervention based on a brand new media article. It makes sense to be patient and wait and see. If you decided what you think about deworming on July 25th, just a couple days after these replications and the press release came out, you'd have a very incomplete picture. Really the time to make a decision came two or three months later when you could really look at a wide range of views, reanalyzing and examining the issue with a little bit of cool. And finally, note the tone. So as you consume these articles, it makes sense to look if it sounds sensationalistic or like they're really trying to sell some exciting, crazy finding. Well, that's probably not good science. And so what we want to do, again, is take those down a notch and consider them very carefully before we make big decisions on big development policies. Thanks so much. Dave, thanks so much. That was a great presentation. Really interesting. Um, so we're going to move into the question and answer um, section. And I encourage anyone with questions to type them into the chat box, and we'll answer as many as we can. Well, well, yes, thank you, Dave. Uh, it was really great, and we got to a lot of the things that we're hoping to highlight here about research transparency and kind of kind of thinking about, about the totality of the research, not just one side, side or other, or coolly considering, considering that, that, right? And uh, I think a lot of people agree with what your takeaways were in terms of thinking about, thinking about tone, thinking about, about what people, what people really care about, about and what is the evidence actually saying. Um, and I would, I would second your, your recommendation to look at the Cardin Humphreys piece, because I think that we, that we would argue, would argue that he's kind of independent, independent not, not invested in the side of a person, person who really, really took the time to reanalyze the data, perhaps, or whatever, whoever. Uh, so we didn't see a couple of questions early, and so I was hoping to go through them with you and have a little mini conversation. And, and so, so the first one, one is, is about uh, overworked policy makers have a little time, time kind of kind of read through, read through the way through, through this large, large amount of evidence, you know, any, any recommendations or sources that they might go to as kind of a uh, first first step that's a place, place to start starting getting summaries or ideas. All right, that's, right. That's, a, that's a that's a great question. question. I'll add on something that you said before, I completely echo the point. It's well worth reading McCartan Humphrey's point uh, uh, reanalysis of this. And then again, in this case, uh, Miguel and Kramer and uh, and Hicks uh, did some did a response to that. So again, in each of these cases, I would argue that there's value in looking at both sides of these um, because they each have a different perspective. Now, on this question of whether they're good places to look. Unfortunately, there's no, to my knowledge, and if one of you knows about it, please put it in the chat. We'd love to hear about it. One-stop shops for all of the very best synthesized evidence in uh, development research. Um, really, this is an ongoing process. There are a number of different organizations that are putting out work that's highly useful. I would say 
there are a few different places uh, where you can find this work. So, uh, two, and this is a little bit self-interested, speaking to the people who are here. So, uh, the World Bank does a lot of work seeking to synthesize impact evaluation and development research work. Um, one of the places that where that's done is the development impact blog at the World Bank, uh, which I write for, admittedly, um, but as well as a number of others. So the World Bank, uh, the Development Impact Evaluation Initiative there at the World Bank produces policy briefs, so does the Strategic Impact Evaluation Fund. And they all, each of those are trying to do some work, again, synthesizing. So instead of reading 10 different studies, on nutritional interventions, you can read one brief that really brings that evidence together. 3IE also does a lot of work on this synthesis, and on the 3IE website you can find uh, these syntheses that help bring together the evidence, and that's another great place to look. Um, and that kind of leads into our next question, which was about systematic reviews and replications and what your thoughts are. I know you, you did mention some ways that they could be improved upon in the future, and if you had some kind of quick hits for if people are out there wondering, should they consider systematic review evidence or replication evidence when they're making policies? Thank you. Um, so reviews, you know, uh, what I talked about a little bit today was how this new Cochrane review on deworming uh, brings together a lot of evidence on deworming, but has been criticized for leaving out a number of rec uh, recent studies as well as other studies that so show long-term impacts. And I think that actually highlights the uh, the promise and the pitfalls of systematic reviews. I recently reviewed uh, about five different reviews of what works in education in developing countries. And uh, a number of those reviews are systematic reviews. Others aren't explicitly claimed to be systematic reviews, but are still reviews of the evidence by smart people. What I found is that a number of these reviews actually found somewhat different things, even though they're reviewing the same literature. So again, the promise and the pitfall. The promises of these reviews actually do, in every case that I examined, bring together a wide range of evidence. And so it's worth looking at these reviews, and it really helps to put an individual study in context. So at this point, we have enough evidence on enough things that I would be disinclined for example, to make a big policy decision based on the results of one study. In every case, I would look around for a review that tells me, well, how does that study fit in with what else we know? Now, it may be that that study plays a significant role because it's very relevant to my context. That's great, but it's always worth seeking to contextualize that. Now, in terms of the pitfall, with these systematic reviews, it's just worth remembering that one given systematic review isn't the last word. And so, uh, always take them with a grain of salt and be aware of whether there are other reviews out there or whether this particular review seems to be of high quality. A colleague of mine shared recently a systematic review that was done on private versus public health care provision in developing countries. And they reviewed thousands of articles. But in the end, the number of actual studies that were of high enough quality to include in the systematic review was two. And so even though it was a systematic review, in fact, it's really only two studies. And so when you look at a review, which I highly recommend doing, it's worth using your intellect to say, well, how many studies is this really drawing on, and does it seem to be applying analysis to these in an intelligent way? Well, that's great. Yeah, I, I, I was hoping you would say something along those lines, because 3IE has invested a lot in the systematic review tool. And I know it's still being developed and improved over time, so Hopefully, some people will take those those thoughts into into consideration. Um, you also mentioned about uh, kind of about research transparency and making data available. And I wonder if you had a couple of words. You know, maybe policymakers are less inclined to be concerned about that. But as someone that does a lot on replication, I'd love to hear what you think about about this push towards more research transparency and development. So I think this is an it's an amazing move, and it's a show about how, it's a demonstration of how science gets better over time. And so there are an increasing number of economics journals that require that papers post publicly the data from their, their papers. There are an increasing number of journal, of, uh, of researchers who even independent of, independent of journal requirements are posting all of their data on their website. So a good example of this is Ted Miguel at UC Berkeley, one of the authors of the original study, um, he's gone through and for every single one of his previous studies has posted all of the research and the uh, analytical uh, 
uh, computer programs to analyze these data, they're all on his website so that anyone can do exactly what uh, these replicators in the case of the, the deworming did. Um, it's an exciting move forward and it means that hopefully this kind of work of doing analysis and then reanalysis won't be a, an uncommon thing in the future, but in fact will be something much, much more common. So we, we do have a question from um, the audience, and it's um, someone who joined a little bit late, and actually I think a, a few people did. Um, so the, the uh, person asks, people get confused with the term replication for this particular work, as replication means conducting a fresh study in a new setting rather than reanalyzing the original data. So can you please clarify that? I know we spoke a minute, but for people who came late, Absolutely. This is in fact, so Michael Clemens at the Center for Global Development wrote a paper last year that highlights this issue. He not remember the exact number, but about 15 to 20 different definitions of replication across different studies. And so in some cases, and this has come out in a recent study of whether or not psychological research is replicable or not, in some cases people think of replications as doing a similar study in a whole different place. And so, for example, uh, with the Kenya deworming study, with that definition, a replication would be, okay, well, let's go and test school-based deworming in Uganda or in India. On the other hand, another definition of uh, replication that's used in some context and by other and by and by some uh, researchers is to simply take the data and the analytical files, the do files as we'd call them, of the original researchers and rerun them and make sure that it's possible to actually replicate the original research that was done. And uh, this is part of what was done in this deworming uh, replication. In the first study, they were essentially trying to just replicate what the original researchers have done. And so those are both definitions of replication that are in use. And I would argue that both of those are extremely important with this research transparency that Ben was asking about uh, and more and more data and do files being posted online, it makes it easier for people to actually uh, do the most basic form of replication where you just make sure those results hold up. Uh, at the same time, as Tim Harford and Chris Blattman called for, with deworming, what we want as much as anything is an increasing number of studies that show us whether it works in, an, in different contexts and at different time periods. Absolutely, and, and just to follow up on that, within Thrae, the Thrae replication program has been focused on what we call internal replication, which would be trying to reproduce the original results and then testing the robustness of those results to alternative methods, estimation strategies, or theory of change analysis. Uh, but all that would be with using the original data uh, and always having that first section, which is trying to do exactly pretty much what they did, right, right? as much as you can. Right. Uh, and, and that's the pure replication what in our terminology. If you look at any 3 IE funded replication study, that's where we are now. Uh, we have thought about trying to do external replication, trying to do the same thing in a different place. Uh, but we would argue at least you'd like to see an internal replication before you do an external replication. Because external replication is really expensive. Uh, <laughs> Let's make sure that the original study was actually right before we go and try and make sure it works somewhere else. I'll just say one more thing on the transparency point, which is that I think that this move towards research transparency also helps researchers to be much more careful in the first place. So a number of the errors that were discovered in the replication of the original deworming studies were very small errors, things like rounding errors, where uh, you know instead of rounding 0.637 to 6.64, it got rounded down to 0.63. Now that's not affecting any big policy decisions, but I will say, now, in my own original research, I'm much more likely to make sure that we have very clear analytical do files that can replicate each table in each of our studies so that should someone come later and seek to do that internal replication, seek to make sure that my study shows what I say that it shows, they can do it much more clearly. So there's a positive feedback effect, not just during the replications being done, but on the original research itself. And to kind of follow up on that point, I know you mentioned the perverse incentives, the round replication, and 3AE has thought a little bit about this in the past, and have tried, we've tried to design the program to get around, or at least mitigate some of those perverse incentives. Uh, so there are replication plans that you have to post before you conduct your replication uh, research. 
there's the, a lot of sharing that has to go back and forth between the original authors and the replication researchers and this peer replication that we mentioned where you try and reproduce what the original researchers did like that has to be shared fairly early in the process so they can know what's happening and they can respond if, if they feel like it. And I know there's a lot of back and forth between the original authors and the replication researchers in this in this deworming uh, debate. Uh, I was wondering if you had any other thoughts on ways to avoid avoid this kind of perverse incentives uh, issue that that everyone acknowledges it obviously exists. Right. No, I think it's a it's a it's a real challenge. Um, you know, to get a good publication, you really need a novel finding. And so, one of the tricks is, it, you know, it's it's difficult to publish in a top economics journal or a top health journal that hey, we used the statistical do files of the authors and we found that their paper does what they said it does. Yeah. <laughs> um, in and of itself, that isn't such an exciting result. So there are a couple of things. I think 3IE's move to uh, create a forum to post these is uh, is a good one. Uh, I think it's important in that context, if that's going to play the role of kind of a venue, like a journal for these authors, then I think it's important to make sure that, they're, that the review processes are similar to the review processes of a journal. Um, I think another place uh, where is figuring out who does replications. So in some cases, these internal replications might best be done by people who have fewer perverse incentives. So for example, um, there are a lot of students who are working on their PhDs who in the course of their PhDs, uh, you know, halfway through, have to do an initial paper to try to figure out, you know, just to try to, to, to get a better handle on research methods, what people often call a second year paper or a master's paper. So those students don't have nearly the same incentives that professors have to come up with a very exciting result. And doing a replication, one of these internal replications, could actually be a very good exercise for them to both become more expert in the methods themselves and also to uh, help contribute to this broader world of science, helping us understand whether uh, the research is in fact accurate. So uh, the, the last thing that came to my mind, unless we get more questions on online, is uh, is is something you said about uh, systematic reviews and kind of looking at the evidence as a whole. And you mentioned that there were some studies, even though maybe they weren't RCTs, that that found uh, deworming had effects in certain contexts. I think it was in the South and the United States, something like that. Right. Um, I was wondering if you had some suggestions on ways that we could improve systematic review methodologies to kind of get at this bigger picture that um, might exist out there even though it might not check every single box of the best way to do a study or something like that. Right. No, I think that's a great, I think that's a great question and a great point. I think the key is um, to take studies case by case and rather than simply saying, okay, randomized trial, not randomized trial, um, instead, we say what's a high quality study and what's a low quality study. And so a number of the best systematic reviews that I've read, what they've done is they actually rank each study by quality. And so, and then when they do a meta-analysis, so for those of you who aren't familiar, meta-analysis is actually really simple. It takes two studies and say, let's say it's two deworming studies and one finds the deworming reduces uh, worm infections by 50% and another study finds that it reduces deworming by 20 reduces worms by 25%, the meta-analysis just creates a weighted average of those two estimates. And it says, okay, well, this big study that was on 100,000 children found one thing, this smaller study found another thing, let's put those together and weight them so that we can say, well, on average, what are people finding? So there's techniques in meta-analysis where you can actually put differential weight on differential kinds of studies. And so a number of good uh, recent meta-analyses in education uh, have used exactly this t this technique where you put more weight on the highest quality studies and less weight on the lower quality studies. And that way, study by study, we can incorporate the very best evidence and not feel ourselves restricted by just one methodology. I'm a big fan of randomized controlled trials. And I'm glad that in part as a result of this original deworming study, there are many more randomized trials being done on development projects throughout the developing world. But of course, they're not the answer to every question and they shouldn't, uh, and they shouldn't be considered the only source of valid evidence. So we want to make sure that we take each study into account and that we examine it on its merits. We have one more question. Oh, oh. Um, actually, we do not have any more questions, but we're 
kind of at a, a time limit. So I just wanted to thank you both for a lively conversation um, and thank everyone who joined us um, in the audience. Again, this was the first of what will be a quarterly series. So we really encourage you to send any ideas for things that you know, you're interested in learning about if there are any, any um, innovative or new projects, projects um, maybe you'd like to be a presenter. We're very, very um, excited to, to have a platform um, for this kind of conversation. Uh, you can see here um, on the screen, I think it's a little bit covered by the um, camera, that we have a, a list of some links um, that you can look for more information, including War and the Anthology, which is amazingly amazing comprehensive list, list uh, uh, collected by Dave Evans. So we really encourage you to check that out. Um, and then if you have any questions on um, the any of our member, member engagement activities, please let me know. Um, you can contact Ben also with um, any questions you might have about our replication program. Um, and I think that's it. So thanks again to everyone and hope to see you next time. Thank you, Dave. Thanks so much.